Welcome to part three of the Honorable Robinson Oscar Everett from July 13th, 2007. Coming up next. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at East of Chicago Pizza on 40th Avenue North and Kings Highway here in Myrtle Beach. We're focused on part three of Robinson Oscar Everett. And we're visiting with the man himself. Good morning, Dad. Great to be with you, Greg. Part three for viewers who weren't with us yesterday or even the day before. And I've been cross-examined by my son for the past You've been cross-examined for the last hour. We got another 25 minutes of it. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you came back for part three. I think it's the great buffet here at East of Chicago that keeps getting you back day after day. I'm looking forward to it in a matter of minutes. <laughs> this place is amazing. Their buffet, even they've got, they were kind enough to pull it out early here in the morning for us to experience it, but it is pizza done right, as they say here. Pete, the pizza guy up front. This place is amazing. This is great. You know, Emma Claire had her fourth birthday party here. We had folks in from all over. Hilda, our around town columnist, was here to snap some great shots along with her uh, her, her granddaughter. And, and I wish uh, I could have been here myself. It was a great time, absolutely. Get me back for the next one. We week. will. If we have number five down here, we are six or seven, we'll definitely do it. You know, it was so exciting the last couple of days. We were really only in the early 50s, and we've got another 50 plus years of your legal uh, training and education and, of course, teaching. But, of course, a very exciting thing happened in, was it 1954 in Washington while you were up there as a commissioner on the U.S. Court of Military Appeals? What was that, Dad? Oh, my uh, mother and dad came up, and uh, lo and behold, we all got uh, sworn in together to the bar of the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, that was quite an experience, the first time that any family of three people like that had ever done that. That's right, the first triple family swearing in in the history. I wonder if they've done it since then. I think some family did it later. I'm, I may right, be wrong. Right, but, but 1954 was a big year. We got there first. Many things. And in addition, I believe in 1956, did you not write a book that year? Uh, I think I wrote it earlier and finally got it published in 1956. <laughs> I discovered writing a book is a lot easier than getting it published. Oh, yeah, yeah. But this was published. What and, was the uh, book about? About military justice. Okay. It was a summary. And I've got a contract to update it now 50 years later. Is that right? Wow. All great. I got to do is write it. You better get to it, Dad. That's right. Update it. That's going to take some work. It will. You've got some other books in the hopper, is that right? Or ones you're planning to work on? Well, what I want to do is uh, do a history of my 10 plus years as chief judge of what was then the Court of Military Appeals. Right. Names been changed to Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. <clears throat> so I've got to do that. I want to try it. And then I'm trying to work on a project that involves my, uh, my father's diary. He, um, as I mentioned when, when we were talking um, yesterday, the day yesterday, before, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was a very remarkable person, had a unique career, and one of the things that was very unique was that each week, beginning around 1915, he would write a diary, typically on Sunday night, telling what had happened and what he expected the week ahead. And he kept doing that until 1970. 45 years. I think it's 55. You're right. I'm not good with math. That I was not my fort. That's right. 55 years. Thank the you. only the only problem was that it was in hieroglyphics. You could hardly read it. Really. And fortunately, your younger brother Luke yes. was willing to break the code right. and transcribe it. And I think the material there is going to be fascinating. Oh yeah. A history and father was involved in a lot of activities in the legislature, had a lot of interesting cases, uh, had some interesting investments. Uh, yes. And I think that history is going to be very, very interesting. Um, in fact, before he died, he asked me, as I was going to be his executor, right. to destroy the diary. He said it was so he, personal. Really? Yeah. And I, I said, you can't, I can't do that. You don't hold him, though, that you would. You no, I, told, I told him, Father, you don't want me to do that. It's too much history there. Well, he'd been a, very much of a historian. He'd worked with people at Duke and others who were historians. And um, he, um, 
he, 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 he agreed with me finally and said that's good. Right. So, good. So you didn't. Uh, no, no, no. I, right. I didn't cancel his deathbed wish. That's good. I just don't think I could have brought myself. That would have been that. very difficult if he took a diary for 55 years. That's amazing. I'm so glad you mentioned Luke, my younger brother, because it gives an opportunity to share about what he and his wife and my older brother all. Uh, they were just re heading into their third year of law school. You know, there may be another record. I mentioned the record when our family got sworn in to the bar of the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. I am wondering whether it will not be a record when you've got two brothers and one of their wives, all with the name Everett, right. scheduled to graduate at UNC Law School in September of next year. That's September. No, no. All, in June, May of next May year. May of, uh, that's right. Now we're, that's, that's exactly May right. May of 2008. That's almost unbelievable. Three at one time for that's the right. family. That's right. Of course, it's particularly unbelievable in that they're studying at the law school where the law library is named after their grandmother or grandmother-in-law. And whenever they go into that law library, they've got to look up at the big portrait Catherine of them. Uh, Catherine McDermott Robinson, Catherine Robinson Everett. That's exactly right. Catherine. Yeah. Catherine, is, uh, as she aptly pointed out, her niece and namesake, Catherine Neal, does as good or better a job, your first cousin, and highlighting the name Katherine than virtually anyone I know. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think they may be making some history, and uh, we still have a family firm. Yes. Uh, Everett and Everett. Everett and Everett. And um, of course, you're the only Everett in that Everett and Everett. Only one alive. But the only my, one alive. My mother and dad are there in spirit. So, so it's really Everett, Everett, and Everett. Yeah. People thought our secretary stuttered. You know, Everett, Everett, Everett. But now it may be possible. If the kids, some of them join us to yeah. have Everett, Everett, Everett again. I don't know. I or even more, five Everett's there. You can use that name. There's another Everett law firm in Raleigh, Everett Gaskins, Hancock, and Stevens, of which I believe you're of counsel. I'm of counsel to them, and the Everett say, I guess, are my mother, dad, and myself. I'm not, right. I'm not sure, but... Uh, it's a long established firm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Of the uh, Sanford firm and uh, the Terry Sanford firm. And, and some they, of those people. Some of those folks merged in there together, which is very exciting. You know, we mentioned Ned Everett yesterday, Dad, who's been like a, a brother you never had, who's been such a close friend and confidant and a former student of yours. Is that correct? Right. Uh, Ned is my double second cousin, whatever that means. I think it's two grandparents married. Uh, Two male grandparents married two female grandparents. Right, right. Anyway, uh, he's been, he was my law student. Uh, he's uh, been a wonderful friend. Yes. And when I go to Washington, I, I, I frequently will stay with him. Yeah, and he was there on the uh, 17th floor, maybe, of the River House or right. on the 7th floor uh, for many years. Um, and he was a counsel for the. Um, Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee of That's the right. Uh, worked the on the Hill for a long time. Right. Has, has been a realtor there in Virginia Realty for many years. You know, there's so many. You think of so many past students. Not many of them are you were related to, but a heck of a lot of students over your 50 plus years of teaching at Duke Law School. Continuous since '56. Yeah, I guess that's about right. I think you I taught that one year, which you shared with us a couple days ago. One year, 50 to 51, left for five years, came I, back in 56. I hate to admit it, I don't know whether it was in the semester, the fall semester of 56, or the spring semester of 57. Is that right? It was 50 years ago. Sure, anyway. 50 years continuous anyway. That's right. Yeah. And of course, the excitement there. And then you were tenured in '67. I think you said you got an LLM there at Duke in '59. 59. 59. Right, right. I thought if I was going to be teaching there, it'd be nice to have a degree. Absolutely. And I took the courses on the GI Bill. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, it's amazing. There's so many things that happen over the course of that uh, all that time, Dad. It's a uh, 50, over the 50 plus years straight. It's amazing. It really is. It's been exciting and great variety. I've tried to uh, get involved in some public service activities over the years. Absolutely. And it's great being here at East of Chicago Pizza. They're kind to let some folks in at 7 a.m. To, to come in and enjoy skee-ball. We've got a 
mom and her son, I guess, or some others, uh, a child over there enjoying ski ball here. Yeah. In East Chicago does it all. It's pizza and fun done right. It provides you can see back, why Emma, back a great background there. Absolutely. You can see why Emma Claire loves this place so much. Well, you know, you, we think it's not only, of course, teaching the law at Duke, also practicing the law, but in 1980, you changed uh, focus a little bit and uh, share with viewers what happened in the year 1980. Well, I'd been active uh, in, after I got out of off active duty. I stayed in the Air Force Reserve, became a uh, full colonel before I retired in 19. 78. Right. I was uh, chair of the Military Justice Committee of the American Bar at one point. So I had a continuing contact, wrote some articles on military justice. And uh, I was approached one day, I think it was just about the time of my last Air Force tour of duty, a two star general whom I knew uh, asked me whether I would be willing to be considered. For, the, for appointment to a vacancy on the Court of Military Appeals. And I thought, well, well sure, why not? I thought it was all just some sort of um, dream, as it were. When I came home and told my wife, she wasn't very happy, you know, with the idea that I was going to be, might be going to Washington. I said, well, that's very, very doubtful. And I was only going to be filling a 13-month, of well, some month expired term. Right. And time went on. I guess actually at that point it would have been two or three years. Well, the filling of vacancies is very, very slow. But I realized the general was serious when I got a call to come to the Pentagon and, and meet with uh, an assistant secretary of defense and some other people. So uh, things moved ahead. Jimmy Carter was president. Carter had um, um, had a commission appointed to consider potential candidates. I was called before that commission, and apparently they recommended me to the White House. Amazing. And um, all of a sudden, I was appointed. Interestingly, that that court has a statutory requirement that not all the, at that time, that not all the members of the court be of the same political party. There were then three judges on the court, uh, actually two because of a vacancy, and those two were Republicans. Right. So Jimmy Carter had to report a, a, a Democrat, <laughs> and I was a Democrat. Um, now there are five judges. It could be only three of one party. But in any event, uh, I uh, got word that I was going to be appointed. And, uh, it, uh, it was in April of uh, 1980. I went before a uh, Senate committee. Yeah. Uh, I guess I gave the right answers to the questions, and uh, the, there I was, uh, confirmed, and then sworn in. And. Uh, Ironically, although at that time, and apparently I was to serve only 13 months, Congress changed the law to say that anybody appointed to fill an unexpired vacancy would serve at least 10 years, either the unexpired amount of the term right. or a minimum of 10 years. So all of a sudden, from 13 months, I had 10 years. How did you explain that to your wife, Dad? Uh, and then My later, mother. Yeah. later they added a few more months. She was a very patient lady, I tell you. And I would go up and spend the week. I got an apartment up there, then come home on the weekend and teach at Duke on a Monday morning, and then go back up there. Um, it was an interesting experience trying to juggle the different things I was doing. Hopefully did okay, and then when I finally retired, um, and my term had been extended still further, so that I retired on September the 30th, 1990. Right, right. The size of the court was expanded from three to five. The president had not appointed anybody to fill the vacancy, so that meant there were two judges. This is President Clinton at the time, yeah. Um, President Bush. Oh, Bush, forgive me, President that's Bush. exactly right, sorry. The, the first Bush. Right, right. Uh, he had not filled a vacancy, and so that meant there were two judges and three vacancies. 
and they asked me, the chief judge who took over from me, um, Judge Eugene Sullivan, uh, he asked me if I'd stay around as a senior judge. I'd become a senior judge so I could still fill in. And as recently as two years ago, I filled in on a murder appeal. No. But he asked me if I would stay around, and I said, uh, okay, you need me, I'll stay. And I stayed until January of 1992. It took him 15 months to fill those three vacancies. January of 92, that's amazing. I swore in the fifth judge at that point. You then swore later, in the fifth judge? Yeah, yeah, then later that judge died, and uh, I filled in for a few months while they were trying to That's amazing. The vacancy. Golly, Dad. So Gone. 13 months expanded to, in the aggregate, well over 11 and a half. You've years. remained on as a senior judge of that court? Absolutely. Right. I, uh, I assume that uh, they will have no great need for me, but I attend the judicial conferences, um, participate in other ways. Right. And as I mentioned, uh, in August, I think it was uh, 2005, I did sit on an appeal of a murder case. Yes. The case was actually heard in Chicago rather than the courthouse, uh -huh. part of a program that I initiated while I was That's chief right. judge. You know, we'd go out and hear cases at other places besides Washington. So Oftentimes even law schools. Yeah. Didn't you go to Wake Forest one year? Wake Forest, Duke. University of Richmond. Uh, Harvard, uh, several places. Yeah. And um, one of the other things we did, this was what I call Project Outreach. One of the other things I did was to... Um, Sorry, yeah, we're filming. Uh, Nice, we got it. Absolutely. Yeah. 7 a.m., we've got some uh, kids here on the <laughs> set. Isn't that great? But one of the other things I did, uh, which was sort of groundbreaking, was initiate uh, television coverage of some of the arguments. Right, right. And you uh, wanted to keep that, absolutely. It was, um, uh, it was something that resulted from a conversation with a guy who was an attorney for one of the networks. and. Um, he mentioned they had wanted to televise a Supreme Court hearing. Right. <clears throat> have, all, have the arguments there televised. But the justices did not like the idea. It's sort of an invasion of privacy, et cetera, mm -hmm. or whatever. And so he was very depressed. It did not look as if any federal court would be willing to um, do that. And I said, well, we are a federal court, court of appeals. A civilian court, right? But we're established under a different constitutional provision. <clears throat> Therefore, we're not subject to direct supervision by the Supreme Court and the Judicial Conference, and we're free to uh, go ahead with television. So we'll yes. we'll have a couple of televised arguments, and it was very interesting. We did some groundbreaking in that regard, and um, I think it was desirable in the long run. Absolutely. Life. It was big. I remember there were times when, uh, I think there was a time you were pumping gas up in Virginia, and a guy had said that he had seen you on C-SPAN. Oh, yeah. Thanks to the, uh, obviously, opening up the courts to uh, to the cameras. We were on court TV. And, court TV. Uh, I asked the lawyers, well, I tried to think, did it affect our behavior as judges? And you know, you get involved in one of those arguments, it really doesn't affect you. And I asked some of the counsel, and one guy said it had affected him at first to know that he was being televised, but as soon as he got into the argument, right, you know, right. that faded from the scene. You had some fabulous attorneys argue in front of you. I remember a time mom traveled up to hear F. Lee Bailey oh, in a yeah. big, big case. Was it an espionage case? Espionage case, case involving an Air, Air Force lieutenant, Lieutenant uh, Cook. And um, F. Lee Bailey made a great presentation. Um, I came to know him through that and had a high regard for him. Oh, yeah. Uh, so um, we had some fascinating issues there, uh, um, all sorts of things, some that would arise in other courts and some that were unique to the military justice system. Right, right. You know, it is amazing, Dad. There's so many things. We, we don't have much time. We're running out of time here on part three. But I look at uh, your service as chairman of LAMP, and we want to 
understand, or if you'll share with viewers real quick about that, your chairman is the uh, service on the North Carolina Bar's Continuing Legal Education Committee, the chairman of IOLTA for many years. Uh, maybe you can share with viewers a little bit about those, uh, just quick synopses. Very interesting. Yeah, and I want to tell you also a little about Lens. Lens, of course, in okay. founding the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. And the basic idea is to try to recruit lawyers who will give free legal assistance to military personnel who need it. And we've been very successful. I think the North Carolina program has been viewed as one of the top ones, if not the top one in the nation. Then, um, at some time in the past, I was involved in in chairing a committee to assure that lawyers would go through continuing legal education. They keep right. attending programs sure. to educate themselves. I was involved at one time in North Carolina as chair of the IOLTA uh, committee, which was interest on lawyers' trust accounts. Right. So that money which was in a trust account could earn interest, and that interest could be paid into the North Carolina Bar to support public interest programs. Great, great. But the thing I feel particularly proud of is having established at Duke Law School a center on law, ethics, and national security. Mm -hmm. This is about 10, 12 years ago. I taught courses in national security law at Duke, Carolina, Wake Forest. And it appeared to me that there was need for a center that would coordinate some of the studies on, right. on law, the ethical implications, the legal implications. But we were able to get such a center started. The funding came largely from my mother's estate. Yes. But, um, and you're on our board. You've been I on am. our board. I am, for many uh, years, a decade. We were able to um, obtain an executive director, a uh, retired, uh, well, he wasn't retired at the time. He right. retired to take the position. Colonel Scott Silliman. Who's a superstar, absolutely, superstar. all over the place. Yeah, you hear him on NPR, you see him on TV. Lots of TV stations that are channels, that's exactly right. Dave, we're running out of time. You know, there's so many things. And Scott Silliman, we'd love to highlight him. I'm sorry, we're, we're getting it. You know, when you think about for you, what has been the most exciting aspect of practicing the law? And then I want to ask you, what's been the best part of teaching the law? Of course, we think about uh, adjudicating or being in a courtroom and having heard some fascinating capital punishment cases or other uh, espionage cases or otherwise. But what's been the most exciting aspect of practicing law since as far back as 1950? Well, I think uh, in practicing law, the opportunity to help people, point one, and also the opportunity in other instances to settle disputes uh, and to get a peaceful re resolution of something which has been filed as a complaint uh, in court. So mediation, participating in that has been valuable. But, you know, just trying to bring things to a suitable solution where everybody is reasonably happy or maybe reasonably unhappy, right. you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So that's been an important part of practice. Um, and, um, you know, the contact with clients, being able to feel like you're helping people. Mm -hmm. Then as far as teaching, I think the inspiration that you get from these brilliant, wonderful law students. Oh, uh, yeah. And then at later times, when they're alums, seeing them catching mm -hmm. up on the news, helping them out if possible and different things. Um, I ran into a judge the other day who had been my student, I think, in 1950-51. No, yeah. in that first year of teaching. Down around, I think he's from Salisbury, Statesville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, that can be fun. Uh, mm -hmm. I've had several instances in which I have taught in law school the children of former students of mine. Right. And that is very meaningful. So, and at Duke Law School, it's been great. I've also had the privilege of teaching some at um, Carolina and Wake like. Forest, wonderful schools. Mm -hmm. I even taught a couple of courses at Georgetown long ago. <laughs> so you, you run into some wonderful people, you have some great colleagues, but I think it's the contact with the students that really 
keeps you going, makes it very worthwhile. And your aspirations did, as, as we shared yesterday with your mother having practiced law for 70 plus years, your father for 65 plus years, you now continuous for 57 years. What, you want to beat them both? I'd, li I'd like to keep going in one form or another. I'd like to have your brothers and sister-in-law join me and keeping the Everett firm going on. Uh, Duke is allowing me to continue, at least for the present, and I've got a great new seminar that uh, I'm setting up this fall uh, on sentencing and punishment. Uh, that's been approved. I'm working on creating a couple of foundations uh, that may be of interest. One is in connection with trying to help federal prisoners who are re-entering the outside community, helping them to avoid getting back in jail. Right. And then the other one has nothing to do with law. It's about finger painting. Finger painting. Golly, so, Dad, I'm sorry we've <coughs> run out of time. We'd love to hear more about Ruth Face and Shaw and the amazing foundation you're setting up. And uh, part three is, is over. But thank you so much for being with us. The last three days, go enjoy this uh, buffet here at East of Chicago Pizza. This has been a treat. Well, I'm looking forward to the buffet at East of Chicago. Absolutely. Stay tuned to more Carolina people with the Honorable Robinson Oscar after coming up next. So many ways we could wrap a three-part interview. It's tough uh, not to utilize something special like this. Back in 99, Dad won an award from the Judge Advocates Association. Part of that speech is here. Uh, the, the speaker there highlighted all of his students are as devoted to him as he is to them. One of his former clerks stated that he is, always knows his students, at least by their face. Almost every place he goes, he sees a former student. He has an encyclopedic memory. A real exciting aspect, though, on visits to our military sites. He has a habit of writing a note to everyone he sees, from the, command, from the commanding generals to the lowest ranking, to come visit his court. One day, an E-4 arrived, unannounced. Judge Everett was delighted and remembered she'd been one of his drivers on a previous occasion. He made her queen for the day gave her a personal tour, and took her to lunch. No surprise, one clerk said, he is very busy, but he loves people. He knows no station in life. He is always very inquisitive. Whoever you are, you have something he wants to know about, like his mother, like his father, like his grandfather. You have something he wants to know about. Very special man, Robinson Oscar Everett.